Okay, welcome to our webinar held here at the Owen McKiernan Library at Celtic Junction Arts Center, the Irish Cultural Center here in Minnesota. And I'm going to discuss the great Irish playwright, poet, novelist, and philosopher Samuel Barclay Beckett, known as Sam, Sam Beckett. Um, I'm here today with my colleague, uh, Dr. Lynette Briney Grandel. And uh, this is the third in the sequence of webinars we've been doing over the last uh, year or so. We've done 100 years of James Joyce and Ulysses, 100 years of T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. So as Celtic Junction is in a partnership with the Guthrie Theater here in Minneapolis, there's a production by Bill Irwin, a fantastic one-man show called On Beckett. Uh, we're going to talk about Beckett's Irish roots and his relevance and his uh, witty philosophical uh, approach to literature, culture, and life. So welcome, Lynette. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here tonight. So if we look at Beckett, we look at the dates of his uh, career, 1906 to 1989. So he lived at the heart of the drama of the 20, 20th century. So he moves between Ireland, where he was born, and France. Um, during World War II, he will work in a pacifist capacity for the French resistance as a radio operator. Um, and he will survive World War II um, and move back to see his mother in the 1940s. We have to understand Beckett's famous face is interesting. Um, one commentator described him as looking like an Aztec with a hangover, but he's a very highly photographed face. And the intensity of the Beckettian stare, the Beckettian gaze is very interesting. So Beckett is about cutting to the bone, cutting to the heart of life, of not avoiding the difficulties, the darkness, the depression, the anxieties, the sense of failure, futility, and emptiness. And you can see that in his face. The, the face carries the philosophy um, expressed famously in this uh, axiomatic uh, expression, try again, fail again, fail better. So one of the things we'll be talking about in the seminar is that Beckett is not a nihilist. It's not that life is completely devoid of meaning. It's that absence of meaning, failure, futility, is an aspect of life that he looks into with great compassion, great sympathy. He expresses it with unique wit and insight, um, but we fail better. We keep going, right? So he's usually categorized, Martin Eslin had a famous book called The Theater of the Absurd. And so his writing is categorized in the post-World War II uh, existentialist absurdity, a sense that life's meaning has become remote, uh, life has become undecipherable, but yet we wait, yet we endure, yet we try to understand how to live with each other. So I'm just going to take us on a little journey into his life. And then uh, Lynette and I will have a um, conversation at various points during this journey about some of the points about Beckett um, that are very interesting. So the core of, of what I will discuss, um, trying to, it is kind of reducing the complexity of Beck, Beckett a little bit, but I think it's helpful in the sense of, in a kind of an educationally helpful um, simplification. So I'm going to look at two major epiphanies in his biography. The first um, is when he he had a, a breakthrough in understanding this, the root cause of his anxiety disorder and his sense of superiority, his sense of narcissistic discomfort, which was a sensation that he didn't feel he was properly born. And then the second epiphany happens uh, in 1945, about 10 years later, when he he, uh, on returning from France and from the long, long, long sojourn of World War II, he 
looks into the darkness, it looks into depression and emptiness and futility and realizes that is his core ally. It's not something he should avoid. He should go into that to create his great masterpiece. And then after the 1945 period, from 1946 to about 1953, this is the period of the great novels are written, the great trilogy is completed, uh, Malloy, Malone dies, The Unnameable. And this is when he writes his first play that makes him famous, uh, Waiting for the Dough, which is produced in Paris in January 1953. So we're going to try and understand like where this um, master of the absurd, master of the wisdom of facing life's darkness, where he came from. Patrick, I just so, wanted to add something, if, if I may. Ahead. So so I just wanted to mention, you know, as, as I'm thinking about Beckett and, you know, uh, coming um, and, and really being sort of an emblem of theater of the absurd. Um, and then the slides you just showed us about, you know, the, the stresses of his life and, and going into the dark. At the same time, I, I want to emphasize, um, perhaps for people who are very familiar with his work, that he he is a hilarious writer um and i did not realize this i think i was probably um an undergraduate and um and um the first time i saw waiting for godot i had not read it um its reputation preceded itself <laughs> as these things often do and i thought it was going to be this dark thing this dark bleak thing which I, in some ways it is but it it's hilarious it's hilarious and so um, I, I, this idea, and I hope that we get into this a little bit more, um, but it sort of reminds me of what's oftentimes said of uh, blues music, um, which is about laughing to keep from crying, basically. And, and I think that there's maybe a little bit of that in Beckett as well. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, Beckett's famously said, nothing is funnier than a <laughs> and he is the Nobel laureate. Um, all right, so Irish is dark. So Beckett was born in South Dublin, prosperous South Dublin, in a very leafy suburb called Fox Rock. And during his life, when he was about almost 10 years old, Irish nationalists proclaimed the Republic in the center of Dublin, known as the Easter Rising. And their philosophy is sometimes summarized the idea of the triumph of failure. So they knew they were fighting the British Empire, which is an overwhelming military presence. But because uh, they were determined to die for their cause, to suffer for their cause, um, and they all were uh, executed after a week's fighting, and Dublin was reduced to ruins, in part because the British shelled it from a gunship, um, there's a sense of failure could lead to a triumph later on. Now, Irish, Beckett was just a child. His father took him up, a, up to a hill to watch the city in flames. That sense of something emptying out and yet having some strength within it is a thematic foreshadowing for him. Um, as he grows through adolescence, Ireland will switch from being dominated by a kind of a Protestant upper class to a rising Catholic middle class. So there's going to be through the Irish War of Independence, 1919 to 1921, then the treaty that partitions Ireland, then its uh, civil war into 1923, there's going to be a whole change in complexion of the power structure until Ireland becomes a much more Catholic place in the 1930s. And so Beckett's social status crumbles a little bit as an Irish Protestant in the South as he's coming of age. So it's important to see that this will be reinforced later when he goes to uh, France and he lives through World War II. Again, there's a sense of civilization crumbling. And that sense of decay, crumbling, desolation is part of where he gets his comedy, his wit. Um, okay. So let's just look at his background a little bit. So he's born in Fox Rock. So where I grew up in, in Dublin, I grew up in Cabin Tilly. Which is right beside Fox Rock. I could walk. I could walk on a on a rain-free day. <laughs> I could walk to his house, which is now covered in uh, huge fences and security cameras. It's a very, very prosperous location. Um, cool Drina is the name of the house. 
Um, he always said he was born on Good Friday, uh, which is not quite accurate as his biographers. He was three major biographers. First was the American scholar Deirdre Baer, uh, produced a magnum opus in 1978, which was revived in 1990. And then James Nolson produced a, another huge biography in the 1990s. And then Anthony Cronin produced another huge biography. And each biographer emphasizes a different aspect of Beckett's uh, career. The first biographer, Deirdre Baer, emphasizes a kind of the tortured youth and childhood beneath the facade of South Dublin Protestant prosperity. The second biographer, James Nolson, emphasizes the change in Beckett from a tormented ang and anxious ridden young man in his 30s towards a more emotionally mature, compassionate Beckett. And the last bi biographer, Anthony Cronin, emphasizes the Irish roots in great detail. He really looks at the Irishness of Beckett. Um, so Beckett's um, family were on a train line known as the, the Southern Rail Line, which they called the Slow and Easy. So it was easy for his father, who's a quantity surveyor, and his mother to get into the center of Dublin. And he goes to Trinity College Dublin in the center of, of, uh, of the town. Now his father is very gregarious and he wears the bowler hat. So we'll see some of the elements of the biography will explain some of the traits of the characters in Waiting for Godot. So the um, bluff, outgoing, gregarious father wearing the bowler hat um, is, will remind us of Pazzo when we get to Waiting for Godot. Um, the mother is much more nervous. She's high strung, she's critical. And we have to be careful not to be misogynistic here, but the the Victorian sort of social mores for women were very restrictive. And there's a certain point where the mother was kind of trapped in this big house. There's just two children, two boys, um, Beckett and his brother, uh, Frank. Um, Beckett is the older one. And it's kind of a, an idealized childhood in this big, the big gardens, this big, uh, this big uh, three-story Tudor-style house in South Dublin, but also it's sort of oppressively umbilical, suffocated by the mother. Um, and Beckett's mother is unfortunately, and again, we've got to be careful not to be too reductive here, but Beckett had an extremely strained and difficult emotional relationship with his mother, uh, May, which he himself um, acknowledged. And he, he, it took him a long time to understand what were the root causes for his anxiety, his depression as a young man. Patrick, can we also talk here a little bit about um, what, what I've often thought of as um, Irish Protestant guilt? Uh, you and I have had conversations previously about the roots of the Irish Gothic also coming out of this sense. And, and I'm wondering if you think it's reasonable to um, apply the same idea to where Beckett comes from, this sense that um, you're in a privileged place that you don't really deserve, um, and it, it's all crumbling underneath you anyway. And so, so trying to make some sense of that um, has produced the Gothic in, in a lot of ge geographical locations, not just Ireland. Um, but I would I would argue that that's also true of what we call Southern Gothic in American literature with the American South. So could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I think there is there is a kind of a Gothic nightmares quality to the imagery that Beckett presents on the stage. When we get to his great plays, such as Waiting for Godot, it's a bare stage, it's a country road, it's a tree. There's these two vagrant, witty, uh, old gentlemen, Vladimir and Estragon, and they're exchanging bar witticisms. That's very much like Yeats's play Purgatory that Yeats produced at the Abbey in 1937. Know that Beckett was in and back and forth between France and Ireland, and he was attending plays at the Abbey. So Yeats is the, is the great Anglo Irish Protestant precursor. And again, there's that kind of Gothic guilt in Yeats's plays and his later uh, poetry, that sense of how do I how do I maintain my status as it seems to be crumbling? So Yeats's poems like the Tower, he's up in the in the tower he acquired in Galway, and he's sort of he's calling up images from his mind as Ireland is undergoing civil war and the Protestant uh, ascendancy in Ireland is being displaced 
by new, more modern, more Catholic, more rebellious forces. Um, Beckett has that, not just in Ireland, though, he has that coming through Europe, the whole sense that Europe is in ruins. And, and his, his genius in following in the Protestant Gothic is that he makes it much more universal, much more existential. He's almost, it's almost like, well, it would be too simple to say it's the drama of existentialism. It is a kind of a philosophical response to a much wider sense that authority and status is collapsing. And certainly the guilt he feels, particularly in relation to his mother, he comes from a very prosperous part of South Dublin. The the Protestant the Protestant classes are, are well educated. He goes to Trinity at the age of seventeen, etc. But his mother becomes more and more frustrated with his choices, and, and so he should have been a particularly witty and brilliant professor or academic of presumably modern languages, perhaps probably Italian, but certainly French. That was that was his training, but he, he decides to abandon it. So Protestant guilt is partly a colonial phenomenon of being privileged, but also there's another sense of the psychological guilt of failing to live up to the demands of a certain conventional form of success, right? And so this takes us into the highly imposing Protestant university until the 1970s, Catholics were not allowed to enter Trinity College. This was set up to make Ireland, um, England, set up by Queen Elizabeth II, 1592. Um, so Beckett's entering here at 17 was one of the great turning points. So this was a Protestant bastion. This was the university for the elites in Ireland. And he flourishes under the tutelage of Professor Rudmose Brown, who's a very famous professor of French. And he starts to flourish in this particular period of time, right? And so the, the next major turning point for Beckett is getting the fellowship to the Ecole Normale Supérieure, which is like an Irish fellowship with this French academic, uh, highly prestigious um, entity in Paris. And as soon as he arrived, the previous recipient, Thomas McGreevy, who was leaving the apartment, um, saw this angular, gaunt, uh, somewhat superior seeming, um, but yet Irish scholarly young man coming in and said, come on, you have to meet Joyce. And so James Joyce was the ruling Irish God, if you can use such grandiose language, in the Paris of the 1920s. So 1928, Joyce had published his great modernist stream of consciousness novel uh, six years earlier on his birthday, February 2nd, 1922. And to, be, to enter this literary circle was the perfect conjunction of a potential genius in Sam Beckett and an established genius in James Joyce. So I've put up a couple of images of Joyce, uh, the older Joyce in Zurich and the slightly younger Joyce undergoing all of the eye operations that he suffered through the late 1920s and early 1930s. And so they were friends off and on. Sometimes Joyce was very touchy and difficult and moody, but they were friends and very close to each other off and on from 1928 over 13 years till Joyce's death in 1941. This was a very, it was a very fraught environment because Joyce's daughter Lucia became very infatuated with uh, the young Sam Beckett. Sam, Sam Beckett was like her father sort of reincarnated. A Dublin intellectual poet in his 20s who left Ireland and was now exploring his, what turned out to be Beckett's genius. And so there was a kind of a, uh, sort of a very, Beckett had, didn't have any interest in the daughter. Um, he had his own problems. And so there was a kind of a fraught atmosphere. And sometimes Beckett would, would be excluded from the, cir the circle around Joyce because Lucia's behavior would be inappropriately, she was suffering from incipient schizophrenia she would act out in all kinds of appropriate ways and so Beckett kind of had to suffer this kind of constant tension in the Joyce circle now he helps Joyce uh, as Joyce is working on his last book Finnegan's Wake which is an enormously complex dream novel but with enormously interesting and very very funny puns in multiple languages language melting into other language um, and it's about basically uh, kind of a hod carrier 
who falls down from the ladder. The bricks fall on him, and people think he's dead. They put him into the bed to give him his wake. And then he wakes up as they spill whiskey on him, the water of life. Whiskey is filled. So it's a, out of that simple little plot seed, Joyce grows an enormous 800 page long um, multi linguistic, multi mythological dream novel of, of extraordinary uh, wit and fun and complexity. And so Beckett is working as a sort of an assistant to Joyce as he's writing this novel. And the two of them would often sit in silence. This is one of the famous stories about them. Uh, they'd sit in silence. Um, Joyce would seem to be sad for the world, and Beckett would be sad for himself. <laughs> um, but Beckett, because he was um, extremely knowledgeable and fluent in the French language, he, set, he was set to task to start translating a segment of that of the novel, eventually known as *Finnick Break*, uh, Anna Livia, Livia Plurabel set to translate that into French. So, the the impact of Joyce though is overwhelming because Joyce is uh, is in terms of avant-garde, experimental, innovative, stylistically brilliant writers. Joyce is the dominating figure, and he's also, of course, an Irish figure. Okay, so one of the problems Beckett will have is how to work through the influence of Joyce, work through the shadow of Joyce, and kind of um, find his own voice as uh, a poet and a writer. Now, he is writing poetry. It's very strange, modernist, very skeletal. It's very hard to pin down poetry. Um, and he is going back and forth between um, Ireland, uh, Dublin, and, and Paris through the 1920s into the 1930s. Any thoughts on Joyce, Lynette, before we move on? I, I, I'm just I'm just trying to think if there's anything worth saying. Um, I, you know, um, you're talking about the fact that he was translating Anne Olivia Pluribel. And mm -hmm. yes, that is certainly a way to get somebody else's um, style, um, you know, into your into your system. Um, in usually in, in a good way. I mean, that's a great exercise just to rewrite someone else's work um to to get it we, we we say get it into your fingers as writers um and of course translating is very much like that because then he has to reproduce um a new set of words for the same material um so i i'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what else he's doing right now because he he quits his job as a lecturer pretty quickly um and and um what's going on between him and his mother <laughs> i think that maybe you need to to go into that a little bit more yeah, because yeah. i think that that also perhaps contributes to his sense that he's got to figure out who he is he cannot be a shadow joyce right yeah i mean it's very difficult for him so through the 1920s late 1920s and to the early 1930s um he does abandon uh being a lecturer at Trinity College, Dublin. He tried being teaching French up in Belfast in Campbell College. The headmaster told him, Mr. Beckett, you're teaching the cream of Ulster. And Beckett replied, yes, rich and thick. <laughs> um, so when he did lecture, he would speak. Uh, there are various, various anecdotes about his lecturing style. So when he would speak, when he did lecture in Trinity, he would, he would say like, maybe 10 sentences in an hour. Each sentence would be punctuated by like, you sit like staring out the window trying to avoid the students. And each sentence, each sentence would be brilliant, like a gem of insight about the French writers he was talking about. But the students were, you know, they were a little upset that they were sitting through these long- Yeah, they long... were in the room when he was actively trying yeah, to ignore yes. them. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was the one groaning rather than the students. So he, he, he basically had issues with anxiety. And so he had issues where he felt he'd be walking through the streets of Dublin and he'd feel that he had to stop because his heart, he had this arrhythmia in his heart and he, he would have to stop and, and you know sit in a pub for a while. And the conditions became worse and worse. Uh, as he gave up being a lecturer, his father was still alive. His father tried to give him some money and help him out. 
his mother was always very hypercritical. So his mother is, again, I'm trying not to be kind of paint a cartoonish picture of her, but his mother was somewhat judgmental, hypercritical, and she wasn't impressed with this connection to the notorious James Joyce. I mean, Joyce was notorious in our book. His work was seen as obscene, and he was seen as, uh, you know, the best memoir of, you know, he was, he was not seen as a, a reputable companion for her, her, her uh, brilliant son. And so the anxiety that he felt in the atmosphere with um, his mother was worsened when his father died. So he's trying to write, he is writing poetry, and he's placing some of it in avant-garde literary magazines in Paris. He's back and forth between Paris and Dublin into the late 1920s, early 1930s. Um, he's really shattered by the death of his father. He's very emotionally close to his father. His father was like a jolly, um, you know, a, a jolly kind of figure. He used to go on long walks with his father. And after the death of the father, he was living in the big house, cool drying up with his mother. Um, his brother was much more conventional. He didn't have these the same sense of artistic sort of conscience as Beckett. And so the, the, the brother would come and then leave. They'd have dinner together. And he'd be stuck in the house with the mother. She'd have all the blinds down. And he so things got so bad that Beckett had to rent a little attic in the center of Dublin for him to work on some of his own writing. So um, after the death of the mother, his anxiety got much worse. So when he's trying to have this little attic in Dublin to write, he's trying to walk through the streets, his heart condition, his sweating, his, his sleeplessness, and just this, an overwhelmingly crit, uh, crippling sense of anxiety would possess him. So it became so bad that his mother agreed. I mean, there was a physician he was consulting in Dublin who said, um, you know, you need psychotherapy. I can't find anything physically wrong with you. And so to, to get psychotherapy at the time in the 1930s, you had to go to London. Um, psychoanalysis was not permitted in Ireland. Ireland was very close to these kinds of ideas, right? So these radical artistic figures like Joyce and Beckett are leaving Ireland to explore the outer perimeters of culture because Ireland is very conservative, very repressed at the time. So he goes to London. Now his mother is financing his psychoanalytical journey, okay? And for two years, just under two years, he does over 150, about 160 sessions. And he does that with, he does that with um, uh, a therapist, now very well regarded, called Wilfred Bion. And Bion is just emerging at this time himself, okay? So he has to try and tackle the emotional complexities. And so this is the first epiphany of, of, our, of our webinar. Um, Joyce is famous for the idea of the epiphany, sort of a sudden realization, a sudden showing forth, a, sh a sudden manifestation of the insight. Uh, now, Beyond is kind of the, the Tavistock Clinic in London, which is where Beyond was based, was a pioneering clinic. It was very pragmatic. It was using some of Freud, some of Jung, some of Adler. It had a kind of try it and see what works kind of attitude at the time in the 1930s. But um, Bion and Beckett were very close. Bion was his therapist. And Beckett would basically try and work through the traumas, particularly in his childhood. And Bion and Beckett basically came to the agreement that the problem was his mother. He had this hypercritical, judgmental mother who was exacerbated a sense of superiority child the sense that, oh, you're the golden boy, that as he became older and, and went into the world of, of ideas and intellect made him more introvert. So he had this superiority, this narcissistic uh, introversion. And this is very much like James Joyce's character, Stephen Dedalus from Portrait of the Artist and also from, from uh, Ulysses. So this sense of intellectually narcissistic, introverted, anxious self. Beckett in real life was much more of an anxious character than the fictional Stephen Dedalus. And so um, Beyond says Jung, Carl Jung was lecturing in London in 1935. And he said, let's go to his lectures. At the end of the lecture, now Carl Jung is one of the most brilliant, uh, you know, healers of the troubled mind. 
his famous theory of archetypes of the anima, the animus, the shadow, the self, the, the collective unconscious. All of this has kind of gone into our into our collective uh, vocabulary. We use words like introvert and extrovert archetype. All of these are Jungian terms. So I just have to go a little bit more in detail here. So Jung gave, gives these lectures over five days. Bion and Beckett attend one of them. And then after one of the, the lectures, um, Jung is talking about a case where a child had a series of dreams that had these amazing mythological qualities. Um, Jung said he didn't want to tell the father what the dreams signified because he sensed they contained uh, an uncanny premonition of death. And then Jung makes a comment. He says she had never been born entirely. Now that hit Beckett like a thunderbolt, right? So Beckett seized upon this remark as the keystone of his entire analysis. So his sense of difficulty with his mother, right? He felt was had had when he when he was in when he was asleep or he couldn't wake up or he was sweating at night, he felt he almost was back in an intrauterine kind of anxious state in the womb. Um, he felt that his behavior from the simple inclination to stay in bed to his deep-seated need to pay frequent visits to his mother were all aspects of an improper birth, right? And so Beckett in that big house after his father died, with the blinds down and his mother there silently after dinner, this kind of critical tension, that had really exacerbated his, uh, his anxiety. Now, this is a breakthrough. So friends notice after 1935, uh, the former, more difficult, morose, anxious Beckett has a solidity. It becomes more substantial. It becomes a little bit more emotionally mature. He shows some care for his mother, right? So this is one of the first epiphany, not being fully born. I'll just, go, I'll, I'll just cover this point a little bit more, if you'll forgive me. So be honest, it's very interesting because um, the idea of not being fully born of being flawed or partly born, um, Beckett really sees this as why his personality is not fully developed. So a second um, scholar, Lewis Gordon, argues in her great wonderful book called The World of Samuel Beckett, this traces this whole early years up until the creativity really rockets after World War II. Um, she really looks at Beyond's psychoanalytical theories, and she says Beyond's main goal in analysis was to assist his patients in moving from what he called the alpha to the omega stage, the point of one mint or O, which she thinks is probably the origin of the O in Godot or Godot. So the process was a probing of self that aimed at personal integration rather than cure. Okay, so this sense of O or one mint or an omega, some ultimate frame. Um, involved the journey to the ineffable absolute reality and unity of the fragment itself. So Bion was reading both Wisdom of the East. So this reminds us of things like Zen, Satori, or some other kinds of Eastern wisdom. So Jung also was very interested in, in, the, in mandalas, the wisdom of Eastern um, consciousness training, right? And so was Bion. So because it was a religious or mystical experience, one's knowledge of O could barely be translated to language. So let me just make one final point about this. So Beckett as an adolescent, again, brilliantly intellectual, morose, difficult as he became a young man at 17, he's a Trinity. Um, he had abandoned religion. His mother was very conventionally religious in a kind of a narrow, judgmental, critical kind of, not trying to turn her into a cartoonish figure, but that kind of sort of intensely judgmental maternal force. And so Beckett, I think his fragmentation was a sense of he needed somebody to rebuild a sense of an ultimate frame that wasn't necessarily religious in some kind of dogmatic way, but had this spiritual, mystical sense of purpose and something that would exalt him out of his narcissistic anxieties. So let me let me just add a little bit more about this to sort of translate this a bit more for I think contemporary um, thinkers and and viewers. Uh, so um, I, I to, in, in my way of thinking about this, we're with looking at Beckett and his mother. We're really looking at two people who, perhaps in terminology nowadays, 
would be said to have been missing some very important early in life developmental stages. Um, and certainly that that um, kind of locking horns and and um, connection or the, the need for connection, but it but it's 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 a very negatively fulfilling connection. Um, I would say on both parties um, is is interesting, and in that that suggests a, a lack of boundaries. I think that's the terminology we use nowadays for people who have these kinds of problems. You know, she's trying to live through her sons. Um, and part of the problem is that in society, that is going to be sort of the social message that she gets. And then he is also trying to get a validation from his mother. And again, you know, that's the expectation of the society. So they're both at cross purposes here. What, what's fascinating to me is that for him, this, as you say, it's, it's a breakthrough moment. Um, and so it fits whatever his own, um, let's call it personal mythology is or something like that. So he is able to make the necessary changes to himself. And maybe you can talk a little bit more about how that affected his relationship with his mother. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, that that issue with boundaries is perfect because Kuldrina House, where he, where he, li where he lived, is it, a, is it has extensive gardens, many, many acres. I mean, she used to keep donkeys there sometimes when the kids were little. And so it was kind of like behind the high brick walls of Kuldrina. He was very much smothered by his mother. When he came, kept coming back to his mother from the intellectual environment of Paris or Trinity College when he was younger, he, he kind of was never able to fully figure out until he had this breakthrough how to set his own boundaries. So what happens is boundaries start being set. We start getting Samuel Beckett, not the son anxious about the mother. And so he decides to leave Ireland fully in 1937 uh, and settle permanently in Paris and to pursue his own writing. Um, he starts writing uh, his first novel that will be published in 1938, Murphy. He loves, he loves giving very Irish names to his novels, particularly ones begin with the letter M because the 13th letter. So he loved the sense of, so he's got Murphy, Malloy, Malone guys. These are the various novel titles that he uses. So he also shows more concern for the mother, right? Now the mother doesn't know it yet, but she is in a permanent state almost of grief after the father dies. Beckett is away. The brother is busy uh, in Dublin being a prosperous uh, businessman. And she starts to suffer from Parkinson's disease, right? Now, World War II is about to break out as the 1930s progress, right? So the next big phase in his career is um, he leaves fully. He's tired of any of the arguments, the criticism, the silence. It's more like a kind of a heavy judgmental silence, particularly after dinner. It's kind of heavy. He was like, so he moves to Paris in uh, 1937. Now, various things happen to him to bring out the Beckettian worldview. And the Beckettian worldview is absurdist, that meaning, meaning is elusive at best. And often we suffer from failure, depression, anxiety, and these things cannot fully be understood. So a, a, a crucial moment in his biography is he's randomly stabbed by a pimp, a guy called with the, with the ironic name Proudhon, um, and this deepened his relationship. We believe he was already in a sort of a casual relationship with this woman, French woman, Suzanne, but she started to visit him in hospital. James Joyce was very solicitous, made sure he had his own private room in the hospital. Joyce was horrified to hear this happen to Beckett. Um, and it was kind of, he was stabbed just kind of uh, under the ribs. So it wasn't quite near fatal, but it certainly was very alarming. Um, and Suzanne then comes into his life and she will stay with him, um, becoming his wife in 1961. She dies just a few months before he dies in 1989. So they're extremely um, close for um, about 50 years. So during World War II, Beckett, because he's concerned with his friends who are Jewish and behavior of the Nazis, um, he does volunteer with the French resistance. He's a radio operator. Um, his particular group of the French resistance had an informer. The Nazis were moving in. They did raids 
apartment and he had to flee across Paris with Suzanne. And then they went south to a little country village to work for several very extremely tedious years as a farm worker in a little village called Roussillon in France. So he endures the lengthy tedium, the waiting of, the, of France during World War II as the Nazis have set up their, their power structure. And that sense of enduring the tedium becomes part of what he's writing. He's also starting to write novels. So he's starting to write novels like Watt and Mercier and Camier. Um, but it's only after the war we get the second epiphany. So the first epiphany is not being fully born or properly born. And the second epiphany is the dark. So right before the war, World War II ends, um, he's able to get out of France and go back and visit his mother. He hasn't seen her for almost six years. And in her room, she's moved across from Kuldrina. She's moved into a much smaller little house, kind of like a little bungalow. Um, and she, she has started, the, there are clear signs of Parkinson's. There's a clear sign of tremors, cognitive decline. There's various signs where he's, he notices how much she has aged. So she's in her mid-70s. And he's come, but he comes back. So he comes back after having suffered. Now he has had emotionally maturing experiences. He's endured World War II. Um, he has maintained a relationship with Suzanne. Um, he has much, become more confident in his writing as a writing writer of fiction and poetry. Um, so when he comes back to Ireland, he has the second epiphany, and he calls this the dark. And this. The dark is the depression. Most people try not to talk about or avoid talking about or suppress or medicate or self-medicate uh, the depression, the emptiness, the futility, the meaninglessness that rises up in life at various points. Um, but he has this epiphany that that is his creative ally, his lodestone, his inspiration. So there's two versions of this and two of the biographies. Remember, there's three big biographies it's slightly uh, disagree on some of some of the um, emphases of his life, um, but one version of it that has more modestly it happens in the room where he's with the mother. He has a sense of this this the sadness and emptiness. He sees how frail his mother is. That's the source of the dark. His own mythology is that, which he turns into one of his plays, is that he's walking alone on in the rain on a stormy night at the Leary Pier in South Dublin, and in the rain he has this sense of um, the darkness he struggles with is the source of creativity. That's such a popular legend that they've actually put a plaque up on Dunleary Pier with a little quote. And I look at the quote from Beckett. So this is part of the legend of Beckett that he's constructing. Okay, so he puts it, this is John Hurt in the play, um, Crap's Last Tape. And I'm gonna read you the chunk from the from the play. And this is, a, this, I mean, this is, a, this is both beautifully written, but also it's fragmentary. It's troubled, it's a little chaotic, it's, it's classic theater of the absurd. So, so the play is called Crap's Last Tape. Crap is kind of like a, a Faustian figure who has recorded tapes of all of the ideals and aspirations of his earlier youthful self. And then he plays the tapes back. And then this is, the, this is him recording his last tape when he's very old and very withered. Right. So the quote goes as follows. So spiritually, a year of profound gloom and indigence until that memorable night in March at the end of the jetty in the howling wind, never to be forgotten. When suddenly I saw the whole thing, the vision at last, this I fancy is what I have cheated to record this evening. What I suddenly saw then was this, that the belief I had been going on all my life, namely, and then crap switches off and patiently winds it forward, switches on again. Great granite rocks, the foam flying up in the light of the lighthouse, the wind gauge spinning like a propeller. Clear to me at last that the dark that I've always struggled to keep under is in reality my most. Crap curses, switches up, wine state board, switches on again. Unshatterable association until my dissolution of storm and night with the light of the understanding and the fire. So the fragmentary quality here can be kind of summarized that the dark and then the tape interrupts. That's Beckett's fragmentation. Then what's the missing portion? The dark was my precious ally. But this is hugely important because the premise of, of the Beckettian worldview is inherently comedic, that you are in an incongruous situation, that you 
your your sense of emptiness is where you find meaning. So your fullness is in your emptiness. So even try to boil it down into a into a pedagogical kind of a axiom is even difficult, right? So it's a sense of the dark when you feel depressed, when you feel empty, when you feel when you feel that anxiety. There's something in it that you can learn. What do you think and, of John there, Lynette? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I, I, well, just a couple other things. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 yes. The omission. The omission. It, you know, it's hilarious. Like we don't get to know exactly what it is. It's right. you know. Um, um, so it's like I, I I don't want to use the term gotcha, but it's almost like that. It's like we're waiting, and then you know, and and so it's uh, uh, particularly written in that way. And um, again, the, the first time I saw the title of this play, I was like, who would name somebody with the last name of crap? And right. as I became, as I as I got to understand Beckett a little bit better, I thought, well, yeah, <laughs> Beckett would certainly. So um yeah, yeah, very fascinating. Um and and um I'm glad you used the term mythologizing too, because I think that um this does create a, a nice um mythology for going into the darkness, you know, there's there's that um sympathetic um weather and everything like that. Um I suspect the reality was the the more humble um location that he might have been in um with his mother you know in in the small house um yeah. but this is this is this is amazing this is this is um a perfect illustration of that i think again the mother is unavoidable um in paris one of the cafes he used to go into it's now a very pricey cafe la closerie de lila they actually have a little gold little plaque on the table where he used to sit and they have his name, Sam Beckett, and his, and uh, they have like a little, they have a little, they acknowledge. So even in Paris, the mythologizing of Beckett has become part of a, almost like a, a, a literary tourist trail. Uh, okay, so this is my final slide, and then we can kind of talk about um, some of some of what he's doing. So um, after the difficulty of losing his father in the early 1930s. The almost two years of psychoanalytic work with Beyond in London in 1934, 1935, leaving Ireland in 1937 for Paris, kind of finding his own creative confidence. But it's it's a very ironic, self-eviscerating uh, confidence. He started to write novels, he starts to write plays. World War II sweeps him away with um, Suzanne into kind of remote village in and doing farm work, very tedious, uh, undramatic life in uh, the south of, southern part of France. Um, after, and, and then he comes back again to see his mother and he's visiting his mother back and forth between Paris and uh, Dublin. But basically he returns to Paris after uh, in his apartment. It, it is still more or less intact. The Nazis had raided it, but they hadn't really taken much except a few papers. Um, it hadn't been destroyed or anything. He settles down to work with a living with Suzanne. And this is the great period. Now he's, there's various terms for this. It's called the siege in the room. It's called the frenzy of work, depending on which biographer you look at. But this is the period of great creative work from 1946. I'll take it all the way up to 1953 when the dough is um, produced. So he's writing. Um, basically, what he does is he's writing in French. And he's also starting to find the I voice. That's a crucial moment for him. And then through the fiction, he kind of works his way out of a sense of the authority of time and space to just the authority of consciousness. So he takes Joyce's sense of the stream of consciousness in a city in one day in Ulysses. And he kind of just, he, he dissolves the city. So we don't know where these consciousness are. We just get a sense of, a voice asserting itself, not knowing why it's there, just knowing it has to articulate itself. So famous lines from the trilogy are lines like, I can't go on, I must go on, I'll go on. But at the same time, I don't know why I'll go on, <laughs> just know I'll go on. So the, the great element in Beckett's humor is a sense of endurance, 
in a sense of resilience, a sense of compassion, right? Now, the culminating period, 1949, is when he begins work writing, uh, Waiting for Godot. Uh, so he's writing in French. So that's a release into what he calls no style. The younger Beckett, who was writing in the 19, late 1920s, maybe 1930s, was writing in English prose. It was an overly intellectualized, highly elusive. I mean, it's difficult to read his early work, his early short stories. Um, and his poetry is almost impossible and without some extremely rigorous footnoting. It's impossible to kind of fully decipher. But here it's plain, it's simple. It's shockingly demotic and slang-like for French theater. So he's writing in the language of the ordinary person. Um, and he's released into kind of a, a mythic space. So we have the tree by the country road with the two vagrants. And so what I, I want to just point out the elements in his biography that explain these iconic uh, images from world theater. So the two philosophical elderly gentlemen, the kind of vagrant, witty, uh, uh, unhoused, they're kind of waiting, they've got bowler caps and they're kind of in tattered suits. Uh, that's Vladimir and Espagon. So the more intellectual, Fighting one is more like is more like Samuel Beckett himself. Uh, Estragon is the more concerned with getting fed and, and the pain in her in the feet. She's that character is more like Suzanne. So when the play first opened in Paris in January 1953, uh, their friends said, "Well, it's just like you two, the way you two, you and Suzanne bicker and banter and banter and bicker. You're like you're like because um, it's all like really quick." Barb, wit, back and forth, rapid fire. Um, so Vladimir and Estragon are like Beckett and Suzanne. And the long years of waiting, the farm work, the laboring work, the tedium of World War II. Uh, Pazzo with his bowler hat is like Beckett's father, Frank Beckett. And then the character of Lucky, who speaks this kind of uh, academic parody of jargon and kind of pseudo intellectual. Uh, explanation of God or the meaning of life. That's kind of a little bit like the younger Beckett when he was trying to be an academic. It's sort of a parody of the academic jargon mind, right? So the waiting by the by the side of the road is like the experience of World War II, but also it's pigmented with these Irish traits, these Irish influences. So it's a kind of a confluence of a kind of Southern Irish Protestant Gothic sense of anxiety, loss of meaning, loss of status. I mean, they're all kind of in suits and bowler hats, which are, but they're all tattered and they're all disheveled. So they've kind of lost that status, but yet they're waiting for Godot. So again, beyond psychoanalytical theory, the, the O is the omega point for some kind of transcendent redemption beyond religion or politics or ideology or identity, some kind of transcendent figure who will arrive and explain their predicament. Okay. So he won the Nobel Prize in 1969. Um, and he is very, very witty. And most people begin Beckett with Waiting for Godot. And then, and then if they wander further into reading Beckett, they're kind of shocked by the novel. And they're shocked by the poetry. And they're shocked by how, I mean, Godot is in some sense a massive simplification of multiple thematic anxieties. He wrestled with his poetry and his fiction. And here he is, he has sort of pared them all down. Um, ultimately, it's the release of Beckett from Joyce's influence. So Joyce is, is a, an omnipotent writer. So Joyce, through his career from his early short stories and Dubliners, his explorations of consciousness and portrait of the artist, his great stream of consciousness novel, Ulysses, and his massive, all-encompassing mythological dream, kind of nightmare of humor and excess and exuberance, Finnegan's Wake in 1939, more and more and more is put in. Beckett through World War II, through that period from 1948 to 1950, uh, 1953, has learned to take everything out, to learn the, the meaning of the dark. And the dark is fair, it's bare, it's bleak, but that's funny. So the very 
axiom of the Beckettian worldview is endurance. We keep going, we're in pain. The character's feet hurt, their backs hurt, their necks hurt, they've got boils. They try to commit suicide, but they don't want to commit suicide because it will break the branches on the tree. And one of them, what if one of them successfully commits suicide and the other one breaks the tree branches and then one's alive and one's dead. And so there's this humor of endurance, survival, um, resilience, but it's right on the edge of nihilism without being nihilism. It is endurance. So it is try again, fail again, fail better. So and it's it is and it's well worth and the last thing is because we have to do a plug of course the Guthrie Theater is doing this one man show and so famously Beckett's work has been turned into one man shows Jack McGowan used to do them in the nineteen fifties and uh, no, a little bit later late nineteen fifties nineteen sixties he was a famous Irish actor who worked in Britain and America um, so this idea of the one man show that mines the 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 gems out of some of the novels and out of some of the monologues and sort of creates a one-man comedic um, vaudevillian meditation on life, et cetera. That is a, that is a popular form. So the best way to, to, to understand what Beckett is saying is Beckett sees our predicament, like you have said, Ronan, as, as comic. Or kind of like Charlie Chaplin and Marlon Hardy and Buster Keaton. But he adds a kind of a, a grotesque Irish sense of Protestant Gothic with a very, very large sense of uh, French intellectual cynicism, kind of post Voltaire and Baudelaire, and sort of weaves this together in a simplified, spare, very funny, primal theatrical experience. A good production of Beckett is like being hit by a tsunami wave. Now, it's kind of a dark tinted energy, but it is very powerful. So it is very funny, but it's very powerful. It's very unsettling in the best possible sense. So Patrick, I, I know we're nearly at the end, so maybe this is this is maybe the right place to say this a little bit more. So what you're talking about, you know, this emphasis on the weight that we finally get as he has gone into the darkness um and 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 really emptied um what 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 Joyce called the quiddities <laughs> out of things um but it's still informed i i'm guessing but i don't know if the, if the, if you would agree with this or not is it still informed um by that sense of the omega you know what we are striving towards um or do you think that he had dropped that concept um in favor of just the weight in the dark no, I think I think it is the Omega. I mean, that's the, I mean, the first act. There's a famous definition by the, the Beckett scholar Vivian Mercer of this play. He said, "Waiting for Godot is a play in which nothing happens twice. It's a two-act play." But um, in the second act, the, the tree acquires a couple of leaves. So a messenger boy comes at the end of each act and says, "Godot cannot come tonight, but surely another time he will come." And at the end of the second act, again, the message comes and says, so it's not like there is no message. It's not like the, that's why I say it's not nihilism. It's not like the tree while bare does acquire leaves in the second act. They do wait. They do show compassion. The messenger does come and say, not yet, but soon, surely he will come. So there's a sense in which some people turn Beckett's emptiness around. And they look at, you know, the dark night of the soul. They look at the sense of, when you lose everything, then the treasure of life opens up. When you've suffered through terrible anxiety because of your mother, you've lost your father, you struggled to be an artist and failed, but then succeeded at the end, you've kept the relationship going, you've endured World War II. Um, you know, that sense of there is an enduring wisdom looking into the dark. All right, I think we, yeah. sorry. sorry. Pretty good to me, yeah. I think that's a good place for the Omega. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is um, if there is an Omega behind it all, it's the great mystery in which we are. The artist tries to evoke it. And Beckett evoked it at that particular period, World War II, and, and Europe and the world coming out of the ruins of World War II. These images hit with a numinous intensity um, and a sense of, 
kind of redeeming honesty. The humor is that some of the best ways people can be funny is telling the truth, looking into the embarrassing, shameful, depressing element of failure, and yet seeing that, you know, I can't go on, I must go on, I'll go on. That's, that's why Beckett is very funny, but also he's an important writer to engage with. Okay, I'm going to stop the share, Lynette. So I think we can take any final thoughts from your book lined <laughs> nook. <laughs> Go ahead. I was to your church lined nook. Um, no, I, I just, uh, um, well, I think it's important to distinguish, you know, uh, Beckett's poetry and then the novels from the drama that comes afterwards. And it's really in the drama that he develops his true sense of of what he's trying to say, I, I guess. Um, what about the novels? I mean, do you think do you think that um, would you encourage people to read the novels as a way of informing um, where he ends up, and and which ones would you encourage people to read first? Well, I'm a particular fan of the first one, Murphy, which was published in 1938. Um, Murphy is very funny. Um, he's still he's still intellectually complex. So it's not the later spare Godot of 1953. It's 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 more intellectually subtle. He's more philosophical. He's more learned. Um, but the basic premise is Murphy is tied to a rocking chair with seven scarves. He's trying to rock himself out of history and out of time and out of his and out of his self consciousness. Um, and this that's that's an early version of Beckett himself trying to rock himself out of his anxieties. It was just right after the um, psychoanalytical period with um, Dion. So, but the great trilogy, which is Malloy, Malone dies, the unnameable. I mean, that is a that is a forest of of bleak delight. But that is, if you want to really understand Beckett, you have to engage. Very funny, very disorienting, very um, very placeless. Like, where are we? Very, who are these characters? Voices within voices, um, and so the the trilogy is usually where 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 people either if they really want to engage with Beckett, you read those three novels after uh, Murphy. Otherwise, it's the drama. I mean, he's the he's the twentieth century master of the absurd. I mean, in America, Sam Shepard was a disciple, I think, of Beckett. In Britain, Harold Pinter. His emphasis is more on menace. In Ireland, the great uh, Female playwright Marina Carr and uh, Connor McPherson. Not many different playwrights react to um, Beckett in, in all kinds of different ways. Spare images, small casts, monologues, a sense of existential, uh, enigmatic humor. Well, and I, I actually personally enjoy his poetry too. Um, that that I've read, he makes up words. You know, there's there's a certain um, strange joy. <laughs> in the, the creativity of his poems. It looks like we have a couple other uh, questions or comments. Oh yes, a couple of questions. So um, Gard Fitzgerald is, uh, is asking, um, I think the, I think you can't avoid the James Nolson. So he's asking which Beckett biography do you re recommend to start with? The one that's most um, fascinating is Deirdre Bears, the second edition from 1990, for his, uh, the tormented youth um, but the most authoritative is the one Beckett worked with James Nolson. It's the official biography. That's the one, Damn to Fame, it's called. And then if you really want to know the Irish side of Beckett, um, Anthony Cronin's book, The Last Modernist, is really, really good. So James Nolson is kind of where most people go. Okay, I'll just mention as we wrap up, and thank you for your question, Gareth. We appreciate it. Um, that there is a link to the Guthrie play on February the 18th, and we're offering a 50%. Um, deal and there will also be a talk with um bill Irwin on sunday february 8th at eight o'clock and then the performance is that night so um i hope to see you there all right well thank you lynette as usual <laughs> uh, i think we'll leave it there thank you everybody so um, um i'll go on i can't go on i must go on i'll go on <laughs> try again fail again fail better so uh, thank you very much for your attention and uh, Please check out the education program here and our classes, talks, 
and seminars, roundtables on the website of the Celtic Junction Arts Center here in St. Paul. And also, uh, please, if you look at the Q&A, you'll see an opportunity to register for the conversation with Bill Erwin on Sunday at 4 o'clock on February 18th. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Lynette. See ya. Good night. Good night.